be proactive and ruthless with criminals. President Buhari tells security forces, however, pleads against reprisals over bandits' attack on farmers in Kassina. Chief of Air Staff restates determination to win fight against insurgency and other forms of criminality. Establishment of the Special Operations Command was carefully considered to address the challenges of asymmetric warfare. Nigeria's First Lady synergizes with her Guinean counterparts on welfare of women and youth. We are focused on the well-being of women, children and the vulnerable people, especially in the areas of health, education, empowerment, protection against abuse, supporting government actions and partnering with relevant stakeholders. And on Good Morning Nigeria today, we shall discuss the politicization of security plus proposed amendment to the 1989 constitution. The 1999 constitution has gone through four alterations within 20 years of Nigeria's unbroken democratic experience. And when we say alteration, there could be myriad of changes in one alteration or amendment process. That's right, Kiria. Now, the 6th National Assembly enacted the first, third, second and third alterations to the Constitution between 2007 and uh, 2011. The first alteration bill was passed by the National Assembly in June of 2010 and sought, among other things, to provide for the financial independence of the National Assembly as well as the Independent National Electoral Commission. The second alteration bill was passed by the National Assembly on the 4th of November 2010 to provide for new timelines for the conduct of national elections by the Independent National Electoral Commission, while the third alteration bill sought to establish the National Industrial Court and was passed by the National Assembly on the 15th of December 2010. However, the fourth uh, constitutional amendment or alteration was a rather long, drawn-out process uh, that was crammed with a number of amendments. And it was submitted to the then the President Goodluck Jonathan for assent in early 2015. But however, he did it give his assent before leaving office on the 29th of May of that year. Yes, and since then, we have had several versions of the fourth alteration which includes the qualifying age for the office of the president, membership of the House of Representatives and the State Houses of Assembly, or the Not Too Young to Run Bill, which was assented to by President Muhammadu Buhari. There's no doubt about it, Kirian, that the Nigerian constitution, being an organic document, uh, would require from time to time amendments or alteration for it to be continually uh, being tuned with uh, current happenings or yearnings in the country. Already, the Senate has commenced the process of what may turn out to be the fifth alteration to the Constitution, and this it has done by naming a 56 member Constitutional Review Committee headed by the Deputy Senate President and Senator Ovia Margege with a mandate to harmonize bills for alteration and report, of course, uh, of the 2014 National Conference that uh, took place under our former president, Good Luck Jonathan. It will also take a look at a uh, report uh, submitted by the Air Refi Committee of the APC on restructuring. Of course, Kinsley, pundits are already postulating uh, that uh, issues of uh, state creation through federalism, resource control, community policing, and internal security will feature prominently as Nigerians are set to submit memoranda. But in the renewed quest for uh, to amendment of uh, 1999 constitution, will the issues Nigerians are yearning or clamoring for be addressed this time around? And how many times does the constitution need to be amended before it is sufficiently tailored to meet the aspirations of Nigerians. We have assembled a panel of guests that will respond to these issues on Good Morning Nigeria today, the first edition for the week. Thanks for joining us this morning. I am Kirian Umayo. And I'm Kingsley Osanola. I'm with my colleague Kirian to also welcome you to the program, reaching us always live on the network service 
of the Nigerian Television Authority. We're right here in our Abuja headquarters studios. And in the course of the program, we have our regular complimentary segments, including newspaper review and business. But before, of course, we get ahead with our topic on the proposed uh, amendment to the Constitution by the National Assembly, we shall, of course, take on a topic which is also of uh, concern, and that is the politicization of security issues. But right away, let's begin with the highlights of the morning news. And here is Nolin Abel Amen. Good morning, Nolin. Good morning, Kinsley. Good morning, Kiran. And good morning, Nigeria. Here is the news. President Muhammad Buhari has expressed the conviction that with the far-reaching measures put in place by his administration, sooner than later the Boko Haram insurgency undermining national security and stability will be contained. This was while receiving in audience a renowned Islamic scholar and leader of Tijaniya movement in Nigeria, Sheikh Dahiru Usman Bauchi, at his official residence. The president said, although the situation is not peculiar to Nigeria alone, the federal government will not relent until the menace is brought under control. He directed the nation's military and other security services to be more proactive, decisive, and if need be, ruthless in smoking out and effectively taking care of the criminal elements. Sheikh Dahiru Usman Bauchi, who was accompanied to the State House by some of his children, commiserated with the President over the recent killing of Nigerians by Boko Haram in Borno State. Armed bandits have killed no fewer than 30 people and uh, destroyed properties worth millions of naira at Sanwa and Dankar villages in Basari, local government area of Katsuna State. The bandits stormed the villages at midnight on Friday. They stormed the villages, locked down the residents who are sleeping in their houses and set the houses ablaze. They destroyed our properties and now we are homeless. His Excellency has done his best in ensuring that uh, sanity is brought to bear. President Muhammadu Buhari has condemned the latest round of attacks on farmers by bandits in Dankar and Sanwa villages in Katsina in Basari local government area of Katsina state, saying that killing people in the name of revenge is not acceptable. Reacting to the incident in which many home states were raised by fire with many people killed that weekend, the president warned that no one in the country has a right to take laws into his hands by the way of self-help or revenge. The president directed local communities that catch bandits to hand over the suspects to law enforcement authorities instead of meting out capital punishment leading to a cycle of revenge and counter-revenge. He urged community leaders and the local authorities to continue their efforts in partnership with law enforcement agencies that bring the surrender of bandits leading to peace between farmers and herders. A statement by Senior Special Assistant to the President on Media and Publicity, Garba Shehu, said, The authorities must be allowed to investigate and deal with any breach that occurs. President Buhari prayed that God will comfort families that have lost loved ones in the attacks and repose the souls of the victims. Chief of the Air Staff Air Marshal Sadiq Baba Abubakar says the training and retraining of personnel underscores the desire of the force to win the fight against insurgency and other forms of criminality in the country. It is in this regards that the Nigerian Air Force graduated 2,079 personnel after undergoing six-month military training. The Nigerian Air Force had made some remarkable strides in its restructuring efforts. The establishment of the Special Operations Command was carefully considered to address the challenges of asymmetric warfare, such as the one posed by Boko Haram terrorists. 
The Minister of State Petroleum and former Governor of Bielsa State, Timipriya Silva, has called Bielsons to shun all acts of violence and lawlessness over the Supreme Court judgment on the state governorship election, stressing that such temptations must be resisted in the greater interest of Bielsa State and the country. Silva, in a statement, apologized to President Muhammad Buhari, the First Lady and members of their entourage who had prepared to witness the inauguration of the APC candidate for any inconvenience caused by the development. The leadership of the All Progressives Congress APC, he says, has directed its team of legal experts to study the situation critically and proper legal options available to the party accordingly. And as the morning news, the program returns with Kinsley and Kiran after this break. Thank you. If you just uh, tuned in, this is Good Morning Nigeria on the network service of the NTA. Now time for business, and it's with Kolo Mohammed. Hello there. Good to have you along. The relationship between the government and national cities is intricate and complex. Major federal policies, especially on tax, trade, transportation and immigration, have a substantial influence on the health and vitality of city economies and the shape of metropolitan growth and development. In a witty 101 with NTA Business News, Chairman Abuja Municipal Area Council AMAC bears it all. So we have wide range of activities, okay, which will indicate that yes, you are not just coming to take, we are also coming to give. But what are we also offering? We are offering so many things it, that will add value to your finances, you will, will add value to you make, being in business, will also add value into your economic status. And this area council is open for such an opportunity. And the week's activity of the Florida Stock Exchange opens today. As always, NTA Business News will bring you closing figures subsequently. My name is Kolo Mohammed. Good to have you along. Be with you again soon. Many thanks, Kolo Mohammed, for the business package. Next is News Super Review. Have a bio at Ebi, our new super reviewer, who's already seated here. By good morning and welcome. Thank you, Kiran. Good morning. Good morning, Kensley. Right. Good morning, Nigeria. I hope you had a pleasant weekend. Thank you. Yes, I did. Okay. Yes, uh, let's begin uh, the review today with the Nigerian pilot uh, from top to bottom. And first, we have uh, Shinkafe, rights, US, UK, EU, others, other embassies over killings. That's on page six. 80% of Boko Haram insurgents operate under drug on substance abuse. It's on page 12. Of course, the lead story on the Nigerian pilot is uh, Buhari talks tough, says killings in any form unacceptable. Appeals for calm, says no one allowed to take laws into his hands. As bandits kill 30, burn houses with fresh attacks in Kassina. PDP insists on planned protests today over insecurity. And now, below the uh, uh, photo story here, we have uh, Imo Guba. Um, Uzadima asks Supreme Court to dismiss the head of your house motion. You get the full story on page 8. Kogi community cries out over killings, stealing by healthmen. That's on page 43. Africa's first UNESCO cultural site faces threat in Adamawa. You get the story on page 42. We are determined to address insecurity. Uh, that's according to the Senate President. The story is on page 6. And again, we have Air Force raises alarm over false news report. That's on page 11. Use a better loot to achieve FCT Security Trust Fund. It's on page 13. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's uh, take a look at the blueprint now. Blueprint immediately below the nameplate says uh, Niger bandits launching attack 
from Kidani Kaduna camp. That's attributed to the Commission of Police and others. With uh, two riders, Buhari once again reprisals in uh, Katsina. Senate will act on killings and others. That's according to Senate President Ahmad Lawan. Details of the story can be found on the front page there with a continuation on uh, page 6 and then also 14. Uh, Boko Haram attacks the Yobe community. That's page 16. And then uh, one of the headlines uh, there says uh, federal government to tighten rules on multiple SIM ownership. That's page 33. Kaduna Abuja route. Railway workers and police in ticket racketeering. You have a number of arrivals there. Yields between 450,000 naira and 1 million naira daily. We are not aware. That's according to the Railway Corporation and the police. E ticketing way out uh, to generate 16 billion in uh, 2029. That's attributed to Amechi, who is uh, Transport Minister at the Infrastructure Concession Regulatory Commission. Ten more coaches arrive. That's what you see there. Uh, and then, of course, the photographs on the front page there are taken from the ticket counter at Rigasa, which is in Kaduna. And then you see some of the passengers as well as the uh, view of uh, the train. Federal government owing us two billion naira. Protesting Southwest civil defense retirees cry out. That's page five. APC insists on fresh Bayasa governorship election. Page 16. And Bochi woman holds election to pick groom. Details on page 39. I don't know whether Annek was involved in that. Uh, NBA to Ekitigo, or maybe the State Independent Electoral Commission mm. would also have assisted. NBA to Ekiti government conduct psychiatric tests for amateur cooperatives. Well, let's start on that human interest story. The, a girl in Bochi uh, found that she had two lovers and to decide who she should marry, decided that there should be a poll. And people queue in, in the kind of an open ballot system to determine who will win. One uh, spouse, a uh, proposed spouse, scored 311 votes. The other got 219. And like typical like our politicians, the one that lost said that he is protesting. That was he is go that was he was rigging. He is going to complain to the world head because some of the kids who came to vote are not from that area. So apparently it was rigged out. So they were unregistered voters. <laughs> <laughs> so what is there? Children are learning from our adults what they see out there. Yes. And that is... Well, but sorry, but, but is, was the election conclusive? Well, it was conclusive. The girl said she's not ready for marriage now. Is it conclusive? But, but she has uh, made up her mind that the winner of that contest is, would be the ultimate one. And guess what? The chap too said that he's not ready for marriage now, but he was, he's going to walk towards it. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the issues of banditry, President Muhammad Buhari has condoled uh, people of Kasina State and also has warned that revenge should not be the order of the day. Bandits had attacked and raised down households in two, local, two areas, Damkar and Sawa local government area, all of them in, in Basari local government area. President Muhammad Buhari said that we owe it a right that whenever we catch such people, we should hand them over to law enforcement agency. He enjoyed local community leaders to, to, to end, appeal to their citizens to hand over any suspected bandit or anyone that surrenders to the law enforcement agency and they should desist from taking logs into their own hands. Meanwhile, former uh, military president General Ibrahim Babangida says that the war against insurgency and banditry is not a conventional war. And he has also therefore suggested that to be able to tackle the multiple security challenges uh, facing the nation now, there must be intensified intelligence. Citizens must be ready and willing to give information to the security agencies to tackle the issue. On an interview that was published in some newspapers, the former military uh, president indicated that his proposal some time ago to have a national guard was to have a formation that will serve as a buffer between the police and the military for challenges and internal security. But it, sadly, it was misinterpreted to mean that he wanted a formation 
that will perpetuate him in office. He has also, however, said that if uh, the insurgency is to be defeated, then intelligence and cooperation with security agencies is the way out. Meanwhile, Bayelsa State has Senator Joel Deary as governor. Chief Judge, Justice, Chief Judge of uh, Bayelsa, Kate Abiri, swore in Lawrence Ewejako and Senator Doe Deary at the government house on late Friday evening. This followed the declaration by INEC that by virtue of the Supreme Court ruling and with the APC votes voided, INEC declared that the votes cast in the election became 146,999 and the People's Democratic Party candidate with 143,172 had highest votes and geographical spread. Uh, some have resorted to looking at it scripturally. They said there was a David who surmounted 20 years of uh, incumbency in Bayelsa. However, he became a Moses. He saw the promised land while at a rehearsal at Samson Siasia Stadium. The carpets were literally pulled from underneath his feet. <coughs> there were protestations and so much so that violence uh, was becoming the order. The Commissioner of Police for Bayelsa, Uche uh, Awosia, has declared a three-day curfew from dusk to dawn daily. Uh, indications are that that CAM has re returned to uh, most parts of uh, Bayelsa State. Governor Doye Diri is the fifth governor of Bayelsa State. He said, I bring to Bayelsa a message of love, hope, and prosperity. Let us eschew bitterness and acrimony and learn to love uh, ourselves irrespective of political parties. President, former President Goodluck Jonathan has since congratulated uh, the gov governor. All Progressive Congress has challenged the INEC for uh, what he described as usurping the rule of the Supreme Court by interpreting the ruling of the APS Court. The party, apart from saying it is heading to the court, it has its Deputy Pub hey. National Publicity Secretary saying that uh, they still have issues to raise at the NYSC. Meanwhile, uh, the deputy governor is also said to have uh, issues that uh, are pending in the court. Meanwhile, the papers also report about another pre-election case in the offing that is challenging the means by which the PDP governorship candidate emerged, and all of them are likely to end up in the Supreme Court. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court has fixed Tuesday tomorrow for hearing in two applications. One, by Emeka Ehedio, our elsewhere governor of Imo State, and David Leon, the APC gubernatorial candidate November 16 election. First, the spokesman for the Supreme Court uh, gave confirmation in these cases. So we have a direction now. They're all heading towards the Supreme Court. Uh, I have a feeling that eventually we might end up having a rerun in those two states because there are several legal uh, constitutional and also electoral act issues that have been raised you on know, both sides of the parties. What really brings my imagination you know, is the fact that uh, when we're talking about uh, you know, Supreme Court judgment, I, I used to believe that uh, when Supreme Court uh, you know, puts out a judgment, that is the final. You know, the return of those uh, issues back to the Supreme Court for some of us who, are not, who don't have a legal background, I find it difficult to understand that. And if uh, uh, there was uh, 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 perhaps a, a belief that the uh, Supreme Court can overrule itself, right, then why, what is supreme about the court in the first instance? I'm just watching because, you know, the Nigerian scenario always, uh, you know, uh, paints a kind of, uh, uh, you know, a situation where we become doubtful, you know, many Nigerians become so, uh, begin, uh, begin to doubt. The, 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 the reasonability of certain actions that, that we are taking. Meanwhile, before the court now, we hear Iherio has a, 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 a filing, Yuzodim also came up with something. So which means that the, the, the court will have two issues you know, to deliberate on before they come up with something. And now the issue of bias has stayed. Right. And it was a, a pre-election matter that led to the, 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 the removal of uh, the one, the, the Leon. It was a pre-election, and we have been told that uh, pre-election issues do not come to Supreme Court. So I'm just uh, a little bit confused about this. Maybe Kinsley will help us here to understand the, 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 the workings of uh, you know, the, the Supreme Court or matters like this. Uh, 
<laughs> don't put Kingsley in the No, no, he's a, he, he's, 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 he's a lawyer. He's a lawyer. You exactly. don't want to comment on issues before the Supreme he has Court. Well, well, uh, well, uh, well uh, you know, it just, it, 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 you have raised a number of issues, mm -hmm. and it, it might take a while for me to explain uh, all of those issues. Whether or not the Supreme Court can um, overrule itself, uh, that is settled. In fact, it's, it's one of the issues you get to learn in the early stages as, uh, as a law student. Uh, you, get, you get to learn that through, through your legal methods. Uh, but there are grounds for the Supreme Court to uh, overrule itself. And you must meet those grounds uh, for the Supreme Court to overrule itself. It's not a flippant uh, condition to say, okay, no, 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 Supreme Court overrule yourself. Otherwise, the matter will just be thrown out. Uh, then the issue of uh, of Bayesa and uh, and uh, and Imo. Well, of course, Imo is coming up again tomorrow, and then Bayesa at some point. The, the gravamen, that's to say, the piece of APC is that I look at it very closely. Sometimes, you know, legal issues are of a technical nature. APC is arguing now that fine, you disqualified our candidates because. The deputy uh, governor elect who was a running mate had a K leg. So the ticket had a K leg. A K leg, of course, is in the, it's in the dictionary now. Yes. So you disqualified, <laughs> yes, you disqualified our candidates. But you did not void the votes attributable to the APC. So, and that since you did not void expressly those votes attributable to the APC, those votes ought to have been counted in determining whether any of the surviving candidates, other than their own candidates now, satisfied the constitutional requirement for being declared a governor. What are the constitutional requirements? You have scored the highest number of votes, mm -hmm. and the then you would have scored 25% of the votes in two-thirds of the local government areas in the state. Now, there are eight local government areas. By if you recall, we're discussing that. It can be an awkward arithmetic. Mm -hmm. If it were nine local governments, you would say six local governments. But in this case, it would be like 5.32 local governments. Are you going to go back to 1979? So, that, those are the issues I'm talking about. Now, uh, Imo. Imo, here they are, I say, look, the effect of the decision of their lordships would create such an anomaly that uh, it seems, you know, th th there are issues that they have raised say, about the votes and the tallies and so on and so forth. And now there is, of course, a counterpoint from uh, Uzodima. So those are the issues. Uh, yeah, mm. As a matter of fact, as an ordinary Nigerian, there, there, there seems to be a kind of a conundrum here. Um, no, not a lacuna. But, but, not a lacuna. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so in, in, in the nearest future, it will be, it will be, it will be, more glaring, you know, what the Supreme Court is going to do yes, about right. those issues. The, the, the Supreme Court may be final, mm -hmm. but they are not infallible because it's populated by persons. And when uh, issues are drawn to their attention in the context of law, and if they agree that, yes, there was an error, they stand the opportunity to okay. correct itself. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, Kirian and, uh, and Bayo, that's uh, where, where we're going to draw the curtains. It's, it's a very interesting, it, law is dynamic, mm -hmm. one aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, Bayo, we'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow will be another day. Thank okay. you. All right. It's Good Morning Nigeria. Still on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll get ahead with our items for discussion. And the program is uh, Good Morning Nigeria. We thank you for staying with us. Now we are about to uh, start uh, with the first uh, leg of our conversation. Of course, uh, the presidency recently drew the attention of Nigerians um, actually on uh, issues concerning uh, security in the country and uh, things stands at the moment uh, there are issues of uh, politicization of uh, security in the country that's right kirian and then part of uh, the concern that the uh, presidency drew attention to was the fact that uh, there will be an imminent uh, protest by some two thousand men and women whom it claims have been hired uh, for that uh, purpose but the presidency also warns that the resort to politicizing and security will not profit anyone uh, so for our first conversation this morning we shall be looking at that issue as we have uh, initially indicated. And to discuss the topic, first, let's welcome Malam Garabashehu, Senior Special Assistant to the President on Media and Publicity. We thank you, sir, for coming. Thank you. I appreciate it. And also in the studio is uh, Ahmad Sajo. Uh, Ahmad, uh, of course, uh, is uh, is advisor on uh, 
public relations and strategy to the Brunei State Governor. No, Kieran, no, that's um, I'm a side that is, right to my. That is uh, Isa Gusau. Isa, yes. Isa, all right, uh, uh, all right, Isa Gusau. You, you're welcome to you're welcome to the studio. Thank you. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Ahmad Sajo is the former Commissioner of Information and uh, Strategy at our State. So you're welcome. Kieran, thank you. Yeah. I'm grateful. All right, uh, gentlemen, good to have you. I mean, uh, uh, both uh, Isa Gusau and uh, Ahmad Sajo are. Uh, from locations heavily impacted by uh, terrorist groups uh, and then of course uh, the Senior Special Assistant to the President of Media and Publicity Mara Gabashi has been in the thick of uh, uh, statements coming out from the presidency with regard to what has now been described as the politicization of security issues. Mara Gaba, give us a background to what's uh, playing out uh, with regard to what, what uh, you have uh, uh, issued statements on in recent times. Well, uh, certainly there is need to be concerned that uh, the, the security is up in the air and all over again. It's a, it's a subject for discussion, market square, political party offices and uh, on the streets, which of course is legitimate. If the objective was to enhance, to improve things. Uh, from what we are seeing, I think that there is an ongoing effort to diminish the success and the performance of the Buhari administration in this critical sector, considering, of course, that for the president, security is number one issue of all of the things that the government ranks in, in the issues that are before it. What is the purpose? Uh, perhaps the idea is to divert attention of the government, you know, and uh, uh, so that, uh, of course, mistakes can happen when there is no, fo f no we don't have full focus on the issue. Uh, and, and curiously, maybe the idea is that uh, think people think they can get votes. It's uh, interesting that the day we left, uh, um, the morning after we left Meduguri, when that uh, little incident of booing took, took place, you know, you had uh, a whole stretch of about five kilometers, in my sense, from the airport to the palace of the Shehu. And um, quite an appreciable crowd had uh, lined up the streets, some of them with the black hats welcoming the president with brooms, you know, APC support and all of the chants against Baba, uh, you know, he's been checked. But then, of course, you had the section of the audience, of the people on the streets who, who didn't like him and uh, said, no, we don't want, which, of course, is legitimate. W when APC won, uh, you know, Borno State in the February election with about 94 percent of the votes you had 66 percent for the opposition so that six could not be denied their own right to come out be on the streets and to protest so the thing is that uh, there is a danger that uh, the attention of the military high command will be diverted especially with the thing you just mentioned now and i hope that the 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 mention that has been given to it the exposure you know, that has been given to this plot, you know, to be on the streets today, Monday, probably will have served as an effective deterrent against whoever wants. It's disdainful and it is in bad taste. Uh, uh, all right, so we are meeting with you. Um, what actually precipitated the thought that uh, security is now being politicized is the fact that uh, uh, we, we had information about planned demonstration against uh, the continued stay in office of Nigeria's uh, service chiefs. And uh, what could have caused that in the minds of many who are, are part of it is the fact that uh, there has been incessant attacks in all parts of this country, from banditry to Boko Haram attacks, to kidnapping, killings, and what have you. And uh, people are beginning to think, okay, fine, if we have service chiefs that are serving and been there for a while, why is it that they have not been able to determine these strategies uh, to be applied, you know, to stem down the tide? 
So what will you be telling such Nigerians? You know, because if you go to the streets of Nigeria, you, uh, you have people saying some things you don't like to hear with respect to the uh, issue of security. And of course, there are the service chiefs who are manning all the uh, you know, uh, uh, security agencies that we have in the country. Uh, it will be insensitive. It will be unreasonable for anyone to you know, sit before television camera and say that there is no concern in the country about criminality. The, the question to ask is whether this is the first time in the country with the coming of President Muhammadu Buhari that there is kidnapping incidents, there is robbery and insurgency. Insurgency was born, insurgency was, was, was grown, it bloomed under an administration earlier than this one. And what President Muhammadu Buhari has done is to seek to end it. And I'm pleased to say that by the admission of this sitting governor of Borno State, when we were there on that condolence visit, he did say that by 2016-27, that, that Boko Haram was, was, was out of the picture, virtually gone. So yes, incidents are back all over again. But I have a sense that we tend to be uh, isolationist in our own thinking. We don't seem to appreciate all of the things that are happening regionally. Again, nobody is trying to proffer an excuse. But uh, over the weekend, we left the meeting of the African Union in Addis Ababa. And a concern that was manifest was that if care is not taken, if something is not done urgently, terrorists on the continent were on the verge of having a state of their own. It, it couldn't be worse. So when you look at all of the things that are happening around Sahel and the Sub-Saharan Africa, there are countries that are in deeper trouble than is Nigeria. Our armed forces are doing an enormously good job. They are not sitting on their oars. They are doing a good job. But the challenges have mounted because of factors extraneous to the, re to the region. And, and Nigerians should have an appreciation of that, be sympathetic, and see that all of the things about the collapse of Libya is not a fairy tale. Europeans, for their contest, for their competing interests in Libya, they were uh, dropping weapons into, into villages in, in Libya. You could just pick a gun, loaded and all of that and just go and you know go on a shooting spree a lot of these elements have found their way in into ungoverned spaces in the sahel so this is a real threat now uh, <coughs> could it be better with the psyching of the service chiefs my sense is that the president as commander-in-chief is not a novice in the first instance is a military com he was a military commander military head of state, and the latitude of opinion, intellectual, military, security available to him, is not available to most of the critics there. So it's wrong of them to interlope in a way and begin to speculate on matters of which they do not have the competence, you know, to pass judgment. I hope we're not being arrogant about this, but we're stating facts as they are. All right, Malan Gabashewa, thank you very much. Adel Sajo, let's, let's bring you in at this time. I mean, from what uh, Malan has, has indicated, and indeed, the totality of the statements uh, coming out from the presidency, are we on the verge of losing a national consensus on how to deal with the existential security threats that we face through uh, the infusion of, of politics? Uh, thank you very much, my brother. I think we, some of us have been victims, so... So we're talking from a perspective of not just onlookers, not people who are disinterested, but actually as uh, survivors of uh, some of these security challenges. Let me put certain things very clear. The right to protest peacefully is a right that is not disputable. Uh, government cannot say people should not protest peacefully. And I don't think government had said that. But when the protest is suspect. Suspect why? Because we are, we are reconfiguring the situation now. These security challenges that more or less now have been democratized since it's gone to every nook and corner, you know, it's a product of some of our actions and inactions in trying to infuse 
our own brand of very, very adverse politics into everything. Today, we stereotype criminals. Given even people who want to commit crimes an inkling into what costume to wear to go and commit crime. Today, if somebody commits a crime in Nigeria, the first question you ask is what is his religion, what is his region, what is his, what, what is his ethnic configuration, which has nothing to do with the fact that he's a criminal. So we are, if we, are not, we are we are focusing all our discourse away from criminality to other mundane political considerations that we have always used to manipulate and ascend to political power. That is the danger in what we are doing. People are out there now given criminality some kind of cover by the manner with which they push narratives that have to do with criminality in such a way that takes it away from the real dangers of criminal activities. And I think that is where we must be suspect of a lot of things that are happening. I am, like I said, I am a victim. My, 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 my hometown was sacked. Everything there was destroyed. The name of, even the name of my hometown was changed from Mubi to Medina to Islam. My aged parents trekked on foot to Cameroon. I went there to see them. I wept. And I saw our soldiers being taken into custody by Cameroonian gendarmes, being denied even the use of their uniforms in a very cold weather. It, it had gotten worse than where we are today. It's getting better. But it could get far better if we cooperate, like you said, create a consensus around right and wrong, and face <coughs> what is right as right, and condemn what is wrong as wrong. It's not like you protest, you want to remove service chiefs. Okay, then what happens? Are you bringing in angels to take over? We're not saying the commander-in-chief determines the tenure of his service chiefs. What happens is that what is really wrong? Are we discussing what is really wrong? Are we discussing you know, issues that have to do with people who now openly rampage villages? and take over, where do they follow? Where are, where are all the people, a whole horde of people will come, 30 and above, with arms and ammunition, and enter into a community, and nobody had reported that I have seen suspicious movement. What is happening to us? And, 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 and I'm concerned. What really is happening to us? So, so we need to look at these things very dispassionately. We have had situations in this country that were very bad. We're getting better and then people are trying to rewind the whole process and take us back by putting dirty politics into issues that have nothing to do with politics. A criminal is a criminal. A criminal, when a bomb, when a bomb blast takes, my brother Gusau is here, when there's a bomb blast in the Northeast, the bomb, the bomb does not ask whether you are APC or PDP, it does not ask whether you are Muslim or Christian, it does not ask whether you are, in fact, as a matter of fact, just at the last, the last statement by Shokau, you heard him. They were the ones, he said they were the ones that killed Sheikh Jafar. They were the ones that killed Sheikh Albani. And that now they are focusing on Sheikh uh, Isa Pantami. So the thing is that criminals do not profile you before they deal with you. They, they kill Muslims, they kill Christians, they kill APs, they kill PDP, they kill everybody, they kill Northerners, they kill Southerners. So we must in that consensus also come together and say look we don't want to support criminals we don't want to support criminality insurgents are criminals uh, what he was telling you just now uh, yesterday there was a meeting you know in germany where they were discussing libya and what was what was the consensus opinion there that some of the people that were in that room discussing had violated the no arms uh, the, the arms embargo on libya some of them, the foreign ministers told themselves, if you listen to them, that some of your countries were here discussing arms embargo on Libya, but some of you are, are violating it. So if there are arms in the hands of criminals all over the continent, of course we are not going to be safe. Yes, uh, well, thank you for uh, that uh, initial remarks that you just made. Um, gentlemen, 
Uh, what is so worrisome in all of this is the preponderance of these attacks and of course the number of uh, criminals that are involved. Just last week uh, or so, uh, the police uh, told Nigerians that they, they uh, you know, neutralized over 250 in one forest, meaning that other forests may have more number of people who are criminals and who are um, or operating you know, in different parts of, of the country. Now, let's bring in uh, Isa Gusso here, uh, who is the advisor on public relations and strategy for the Bruno State uh, Governor. What is your take in all of this? Apart from the issue of uh, politicization, what are the core issues to you as a resident of Bruno State? Well, first and foremost, <coughs> like Governor Zulu did say last week, we living in Borno have, can bear testimony to the fact that there has been a progress. If you are to compare with what used to be the case, with what has happened between 2015 and especially 2017, like the governor did say. And then one thing nobody can take away from the president is that he is extremely sincere in the fight against Boko Haram. Nobody can challenge that. From my understanding, it was based on that sincerity that probably informed his decision in even bringing in Borno's sons to hold key positions because he knows that having an NSA from Borno, Chief of Army Staff from Borno, I mean, you don't expect them not to be committed in salvaging the situation. But I think one of the things we must try to do away with is the issue of suspicion that, that, that I think is sometimes ex doesn't really help. I've covered the Boko Haram crisis, unfortunately, from 2003 when it started while they were Taliban. The Boko Haram insurgents have a history of regrouping. They are always like that. If you go back to when they appeared in October 2003 in, in Kanama in Yobi State, the military was deployed. They went on the ground. Nothing was heard of them until 2004. They attacked Bama and Goza, fled over the, the Goza hills. They disappeared. Nothing was heard about them until 2007 when they appeared in Panshekara in April. They went on the ground. Then they surfaced again under Yusufia name in 2009 in, in Borno State and then expanded to Bauchi and other places. They went on the ground, then two th they, were, they were defeated, then 2010, Shekau appeared and promised that he was going to bring down, you know, the whole of the country. A lot of people thought Shekau was, was, I mean, was, was somebody to, to just, you know, wave away. But the fact remains that we must make concerted efforts to acknowledge that a lot of people in Borno State are giving everything to the fight against Boko Haram. To, the, to be honest with you, I usually feel very bad when I hear anyone raising questions about the sincerity of the people of Borno State in the fight against Boko Haram. Like a story, I told a story two days ago. In 2013, I and the former governor with whom I worked went to Konduga. When we went to Konduga, there was an attack in Daluri. A woman a mother and her, and her husband approached the governor. They were shouting at the top of their voices. And the governor, the security aides were trying to stop them. And the governor said, allow them. They came and said, one of our sons is a member of the Boko Haram. He has escaped from the bush. He has been hiding in our house in the last three days. I want your excellency to assign security aides to go and bring out that boy. They picked him up. I don't know whether he's alive. I don't know what has happened. Now, this is the extent of commitment. From 2013 to date, more than 26,000 youths in Borno, sons and daughters of Borno, they, they didn't fall from the moon. They are sons of people of Borno have given their lives, you know, in fighting the Boko Haram. More than 1,000 of them have been killed in the last two years. Now, how would it look like? And then when you go back to how the Boko Haram began to return in, in, in 2010, they started by gradual assassination of district heads. They killed a number of district heads, a number of, uh, of ward heads, and even traditional rulers like we know. They killed the Emir of Goza. They have, they have sacked many. Why did they do that? Because they know that these district heads are very critical in generating intelligence within the community. It got to a point where 
when you report anything about Boko Haram, you get killed the following day. So when you find people who are living in trauma, people who are displaced, people who are suffering, and then somebody begins to raise suspicion on their level of commitment, you, you end up demoralizing them. So I think it's one issue that as a country we need to take very seriously. We need to address that. Now coming to the issue of politicization, I think some people are not fair to the president, like I have said. But at the same time, we should know that you can hardly divulge politics from security. The reason is because if a lot of people would think that branding the politicization is like you are being evasive as a government, and they will tell you that every political party in the opposition would always point to lapses of security. And then every government in power will always point to the successes it has recorded. So people will tell you, but at the same time, I think we also need to be very careful in the issue of security. We must know that for every act that, that, that I mean, before you can win any election, people have to be alive. People have to be alive before you can. So whatever it is that we are doing, we must try as much as possible to acknowledge that security is every man's business, and we all have responsibilities towards that. Okay, well, it's all good. So, uh, thank you very much. But I just, before I bring in Garba Shehu again, tell us something. What, in your opinion, accounts for the resurgence of Boko Haram in the last couple of years? Well, I started by telling you that they have a history of regrouping. As a strategy, they have that. And then, I think the issues of Libya, and then the porosity of some of our land borders may have created greater opportunities for the Boko Haram to extend their alliances. And of course, you know, the defeat of the ICs in, in, in other parts of the world, of course, they would always look for, look for their alliances, look for how to, you know, to come back to other communities. The truth of the matter is that we need to do so much around our land borders. We need to take that very seriously. Of course, we must give credit to the president in trying to forge regional alliances. I mean, when he came into power, one of the first things he started doing was traveling all over the world. Within Africa, he was able to reaffirm Nigeria's position. He was able to win hearts. I mean, we have seen enhanced uh, collaboration between Nigeria and, 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 other, and other countries. We need to do a lot more. And then, the, the other angle is the issue of education, the issue of poverty. I know that the president has shown a lot of concern. Um, a few days ago, we attended a meeting with the governor. We, we met with the minister of finance. There is a major package that the president has approved as part of intervention to Borno State. Maybe I, am not, uh, I don't have the authority to announce it, but I know it's a major package on the part of the, the president, and I, and I believe it will go a long way. But we need to continue to do whatever it is that we can on education. Because Boko Haram, yes, within the Boko Haram, there are those who are ideologically driven, people who believe that the more they kill, the greater their chance of entering paradise. But they are also do, there are also those who are induced to be part of it. I remember in 2014, the Joint Tax Force at that time presented a young man you know, to, to, the, to, the, to the former governor who, who, come, who, who, who did reveal that he was being paid 5,000 Naira to spy on soldiers. There was another young man who said he was being paid 5,000 Naira to set our schools ablaze. So there are the, 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 those who are, who are driven you know, by poverty. But of course, that is not an excuse. But we must be very deliberate in trying to address some of these things. You know, it's like, so thanks. Uh, Kiria, I, I just, I, I, want to, I want to come back to uh, Akma Sajo. Look, it's still on the politicization of, of security and the issue I raised earlier about forging a national consensus. In ramping up the politics around our security, are we facing the risk of also ignoring some very critical element in our security challenges, namely conflict entrepreneurs, or those you know who profit from the conflict that we're having now. Yeah, I, I think we call them conflict merchants, and these conflict merchants are there. They are benefiting very tremendously. But but let us look at the real undercurrent because 
when we focus more on insurgency, we have, we're leaving out a lot of other criminal activities across the country. The Northwest, uh, ban uh, banditry, kidnapping, cattle rustling, you know, and uh, in fact, some attacks that are just heartless that you cannot even pigeonhole them anywhere. I think one of the undercurrents that we need to look at very critically, and this is for all of us, is that the social gap is widening daily. The social gap between those that are privileged and those that are underprivileged, the gap is widening every day. And those of us that are privileged, in fairness to ordinary people, sometimes we, 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 we have not just lost empathy, we have not just lost sympathy for the plight of ordinary people. It's a class struggle then. We, 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 we act sometimes insult their sensibilities by flaunting you know our, our riches in their faces when some of them the only thing they think about is where one meal comes in a day we need to start thinking we need to start having a lot more empathy we need to start we, we need to start reconstructing our social relationships you know in you know, our that's country what I said. is this a class struggle then it is to a large extent, you know, to a large extent. But politicians have learned over time that the best way to gain political ascendancy in Nigeria is to exploit our natural fault lines, region, religion, and ethnicity. And once you exploit those natural fault lines, you ascend to power. And once you ascend to power, of course, you no longer think about in terms of region, religion, and ethnicity, mm -hmm. but you think about yourself. So we need to reconstruct all of these things. And that is what is the incursion that is coming into security architecture. So the, the dirty politics of region, religion, and ethnicity is making an incursion into security uh, configuration. And I think on a, on, a, on a very serious note that part of what we need to do is to increase the level of intelligence gathering on activities of people within society, not just the criminals that are known to carry guns and go and fight in, this, in, the, in the streets, but even those that benefit from the activities of these criminals, the conflict merchants you are talking about. We need to increase intelligence, we need to expose them, we need to shame them because they are enemies of this country. Yes, yeah, so you've just hit the point uh, in terms of uh, intelligence gathering because uh, that is uh, the major instrument we have in an asymmetric kind of war uh, that uh, we are we're engaged you know, with. Uh, Isaac Gusau made a very valid point you know, when he was speaking, um, when he mentioned that some people uh, we are paid to uh, carry out surveillance uh, on our soldiers, to bond schools and all of that. Such elements are still existing because the question Kinsley put to you was actually uh, the, the resurgence, you know, after the defeat that we all uh, you know, rejoiced on about two years ago, uh, they seem to have returned. And uh, of course, uh, the man Shekau is, is talking tough. Right. I want to, I want us to look at the, the, the issue of uh, politicization as a way of uh, Ask, um, of uh, encouraging the government to re-strategize, especially those, uh, the chiefs, the service chiefs and their um, subordinates, to re-strategize and see how they can come around this, uh, this uh, resurgence, you know, of uh, Boko Haram. So, Madam Madam is it, uh, is it necessary for the operators of the security agencies to re-strategize this time around? No, there is no doubt about it. Uh, there cannot be a, a war as we have uh, in terms of strategy that is cast in stone. Uh, you have to keep reviewing and changing your tactics. And we have seen a lot of that, even in the discussion, you know, against, uh, uh, you know, the, the service chiefs, uh, we have, even in the parliament, uh, highly sensitive, you know, a subject of the of the super counts was was a public uh, issue of public debate and all of that. So that is to say that these things must change, and I think the president did promise that in Meduguri. However, uh, please permit me also to just uh, explain, uh, and I'm, I'm happy that Isa raised the issue because when the president left Meduguri, he had uh, said of the need for more intelligence, more support for security. And, and we've seen the backlash from social media. 
that as if the president has raised question about the commitment of the people of Borno to the war against her. Never would the president have said anything like that. But as Sajo said, intelligence, competent intelligence is sine qua non. But there cannot be success in any war without intelligence. And look at the mother who surrendered her own son. So that's the kind of, you know, thing that you had uh, looked to. And, and <coughs> when you look at then, uh, for instance, because Kerian had earlier mentioned, because this problem of so-called resurgence isn't just a born nothing, the, the kidnapping and banditry and all of that. So you, I think that Nigerians need also a better understanding, appreciation of what's happening. The incident two days ago in, mid, in Katsina State, where two communities were attacked, huge number of people were killed. And when you hear from the police that in one community, a bandit was seized, his motorcycle was taken away. And the local leader, the police said, return this motorcycle to these people. And the local vigilantes were adamant. The next village, they seized a vigilant, a band, suspected bandit. They, 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 they killed him. So a lot of the problems that we have in some of this, in the inner parts of the country, are coming from self-help. People don't want to report to authorities where they see incidents such as this one. They take laws into their hand. So then that's, that makes you think that some of the agitation, is this arising from the, the work of the chief of labor staff or the chief of air staff or the chief of army staff that people are calling for their head? <coughs> it is not, certainly. Communities have just got to see this, all of these things as being our own. We take ownership. I'm just wondering, uh, you know, Mama Gabashew, listening to Ahmed Sajo and the perspective that he's brought on, I mean, I tried to prompt him again by asking if we're dealing with a class war. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, there are, this is multidimensional now, no question about that. You raise the fact that, look, the Sahel is, is ablaze virtually, mm -hmm. and you have all kinds of freelance criminal elements who are all over the place. What we thought was uh, in the Northeast has now spread to other parts, of, other, other parts of the country. And we saw an example a couple of weeks ago uh, when uh, travelers who had uh, uh, found soccer using the Abuja Kaduna rail line suddenly now became targets uh, for kidnappers as soon as they arrived in uh, Regasa, which mm. is Kaduna. They said, okay, since we cannot catch you on the highway, we will wait for you at the train station or you know, in the precincts of the train station and pick you up. And the stories you hear about kidnapping for ransom uh, quite clearly tells you, all right, fine, we can't come to your home now and find money. Everybody is using the uh, ATM. We can't grab you otherwise. If we hold you, uh, your people, will, your people, of course, will be forced, you know, to pay money. Uh, and that goes on. And on this, on Good Morning Nigeria, when we were discussing also the security issues, I asked one of our regular guests, who's a security uh, expert. I said, look, yeah, we often finger Libya, the crisis in Libya, for the flow of small arms and light weapons into Nigeria. And the question I asked was, why is it that Egypt which is next door to uh, Libya, is it a magnet for these same small arms and light weapons and the kind of criminality that we are seeing? And his response was, okay, fine. It has to do with demand and supply. So why do we appear to have a greater demand for it? Does that speak to the point that Amr Sajo raised with regard to the fact that, look, the, the uh, inequalities are rather extensive. What would that say in terms of public information management to how we can enlarge and otherwise alter uh, the narratives about the, if, if you like now, the crass politics that has been brought into the security uh, challenges of the country? Well, let me say that uh, uh, in your uh, deep assessment of the situation, Egypt is in deep trouble with terrorism. Sinai region is uh, almost ungovernable and uh, and uh, Sham al Sheikh, which was like a magnet to international tourism. I was there some two years ago. Sh Sham al Sheikh was a, sh was a ghost of its own, the bombings of the you know, Egypt airplane and all of that. So they have their own problems. And when you see all of these things that are happening today on, on the rest parts of the continent, the so called jihadist violence is present in DRC, in Mozambique, in Uganda, in, in, in Angola. So problem is spreading, and this is why the chairman of, new chairman of African Union, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, actually said he will convene a special summit this year. On, there seems to be a breakdown 
of morality of institutions and of, of society. Uh, I would agree that, uh, you know, the, the, the social inequality is a part of it, but so also is injustice and so also is the rising of, 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 of uh, intolerance and, and, and fanatical attitudes, especially on matters of culture and religion. All right. Uh, uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Madam Gavashir. Gentlemen, um, of course, uh, there's no way we can actually, uh, you know, say that we have done justice to this conversation uh, because of want of time. There are so many issues that are, are coming up. And I would have actually uh, taken up the issue of uh, uh, thinking towards uh, how uh, ISIS was dealt with, you know, in, in Iraq, uh, you know, uh, Syria, and 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 and, uh, and that area you know because uh, it was a concerted effort by nations you know who contributed uh, militarily and otherwise to do that uh, maybe this is what we are going to be thinking of in the nearest future with respect to uh, the basin Boko Haram totally and other criminals in our country so at this point I'd like to um, appreciate you uh, once more for being here for the first segment of our discussion this morning on Good Morning Nigeria uh, Isa Gusau, uh, we thank you for coming. Uh, you are from Brunei State, Special Advisor on Public Relations and the Strategy uh, to the Governor of Brunei State. And also, uh, Madam Gerber Shehu, uh, Senior Special Assistant to the President on Media and Publicity. Thank you uh, for always being here uh, to clarify issues uh, concerning the Presidency. And of course, uh, Ahmad Saju, former Commissioner of Information and Strategy, Alabama State. We also appreciate your contribution this morning. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're still watching Good Morning Nigeria on the network service of the ANTA. We have a second conversation and that will be coming up immediately after this short break. Before the National Assembly went on recess last December, it was widely speculated that the legislative business for 2020 will include constitutional amendment. Meanwhile, alteration of the constitution is quite a stringent process because for the alteration to be valid, it must be passed by vote of not less than four-fifths majority of all the members of each house of the National Assembly, that is, the Senate and the House of Representatives. After being passed by the requisite majority of both chambers, it must then be approved by resolution of the House of Assembly of not less than two-thirds of all the states in Nigeria which is at least 24 states, after which the proposed alterations would then be presented before the president for assent. In the past, the lawmakers have given so much attention to issues ranging from devolution of powers, which was rejected by the Senate in the 8th Assembly, financial autonomy for state legislature, issues of local government autonomy, state creation and boundary adjustment, which was rejected by the Senate, determination of pre-election matters and timeline for the determination of electoral disputes. In the past, the two chambers of the National Assembly did not agree on some bills for amendment, such as separation of the office of the Attorney General of the Federation and of the State from the office of the Minister of Justice or Commissioner for Justice. Currently, many issues just leave for attention in the renewed quest for constitutional amendment include restructuring, state creation, community policing, among others. But the question is, will the issues Nigerians are yearning for be addressed this time around? These and other questions will engage guests on Good Morning Nigeria shortly. All right, Aisha Bali, thanks a lot for that background. I'm here with us in the Abuja studios to discuss this, we'd like to welcome Honorable Mohammed Tahir Mogudo, is Chief Whip of the House of Representatives. Honorable, pleasure to have you again on Good Morning Nigeria. Thank you for inviting me. Also here with us in the studios is a political scientist and former Vice Chancellor of the University of Abuja, Professor Nuhu Yakub. Prof, pleasure to have you around. It's a pleasure to be here too, thank you. Okay. And uh, from our Lagos studio, we have two guests there, uh, but let's begin by introducing uh, Senator Sabi Abdullahi, is the Deputy Chief Whip of the Senate. So you're welcome to Good Morning Nigeria. Thank you for having me. And also from Lagos, we have Ezenwa Nwago. Ezenwa is a civil society activist and chairman, Partners for Electoral Reform. We are glad to have you this morning on our show. Yes. 
All right, Kinsley. All right. Uh, well, I, I want to start a conversation uh, from uh, Lagos. Uh, as in one, you have, uh, is that an emotional feature that you have as part of your outfield this morning? Uh, but otherwise, uh, that is welcome. But tell us uh, something. Uh, there's a proposal already now for the uh, amendment to the Constitution. Uh, this is coming from the Senate, which has set up a 56-member uh, committee. Is a further amendment to the Constitution warranted? And if so, from your perspective, what are the issues you would like to find um, on the amendment plate? Well, thank you. Um, I, I, I think that um, the continuous retooling of the laws is, is very important. But I just have a worry uh, where we, we turn that to an industry. Uh, turning it to an industry is to say that um, I, I do not think that we should constitute constitutional amendment to a ritual where every, every time that there is a new, um, whether the eighth, fourth, fifth, senate, makes it a duty to uh, retool the Constitution with the cost implication that that has. Um, conservatively, a lot of people have put the issue of constitutional amendment to close to over 10 billion naira in, um, in the last few years. And whether we have value for money from that is something that we need to interrogate. But as to whether it's important to continue to revisit our laws, and then, but some of the germane issues that, that face us are the issues that border on the well-being of citizens. For instance, um, I was discussing with a distinguished senator here earlier when we came into the studio. You, you cannot, for instance, say that um, um, education should be free and compulsory uh, from, from uh, basic to tertiary. And then you put a proviso that weakens that very uh, that very provision that makes that makes education uh, very very uh, affordable for for the majority of your citizens consistently we have continued to amend the constitution without engaging that issue uh, so maybe this will be an opportunity for patriots within the lawmaking uh, environment to begin to think in terms of how we strengthen that and ensure that we deal with the crisis of education. We deal with the fact that majority of our citizens are not able to uh, get get some education. That I, I think that will be very very uh, important. We need to also uh, begin to look at issues around our elect, um, leadership recruitment process. How is it possible for us to continue to have elections at the subnational level that are completely at variance with our expectations for, for national elections. Every election that has been conducted in the states by the, by, by the chief executives of those states, they have taken 100%, if not if sometimes 99%. There is no place for opposition. Uh, and, and then we, we move on as if that's not, uh, that's not going to impact on the quality of citizen education around electoral issues. So if we are amending the Constitution, we need to now really take into issue the, the, the whole gamut around state independent electoral commissions and what is expected of them and whether eventually we want to take that away and make that responsibility that of INEC and do the hard thinking that is required to say whether um, at the INEC that we want to give that responsibility now was not in the same state uh, where the state independent electoral commissions were a few years ago when we began as um, to oversight INEC and put the pressure that has brought it to the point where it is now. Uh, so generally for me, there are two basic issues. If we deal with the areas that <coughs> deal with the welfare of citizens in our constitution, we will deal with security that it will have its impact on security, it will have its impact on health, it will have its impact on the quality of life that your citizens lead, and then eventually it would also improve their ability to make decisions that impact on the quality of leadership that you have. All right, uh, uh, thank you, Ezema um, Wagu. We should definitely return to you in, in due course. Um, back to the studio here, let me 
uh, bringing uh, Professor Nuhu Yakub here. You know, Nigeria is very rich in constitution making. Uh, I mean, when we were initially exposed to a constitution, we heard about uh, Richard's constitution, Mark Fasson's constitution, all these uh, form part of the uh, pre and the post independence constitution in this country. And now we have the 1999 um, constitution that has been amended on four occasions. And now we are talking about another amendment of the same constitution. America has a constitution that has been more than 20, 200 years now. I'm not sure how many times it's been amended. Uh, so are, are we really, um, uh, you know, are we, are we short of the knowledge of, uh, you know, uh, encapsulating structure that can guide governance and the general behavior of Nigerians, why has it become so difficult? And uh, do we indeed need to revisit these constitutional amendments that we are about talking about now? Well, I think uh, we should uh, understand or accept one truism, which is that you know, uh, a society is, a is in a state of flux. It's a dynamic entity, and therefore, we should expect that new perspectives are going to come up. Uh, for instance, if you look at, if you compare the 1999, sorry, 1979 constitution with the 1999 constitution as amended, you will discover, in fact, the preamble to that, uh, to the 1999 constitution clearly states that, you know, the 1979 constitution was, you know, brought out and a committee of about 20 or 30 people were asked to go and review it and adopt what they think will be very useful given the context or the, uh, yeah, the context within which the new constitution was going to be brought into being as of 1999. And they went into, in fact, I was looking at uh, the two documents and I discovered that actually what happened was just a tinkering of that uh, 79 constitution you know, to, I mean, to now have, you know, the 1999 constitution. And since that time, that has been, I mean, that, that um, 1799 constitution came into being, you remember a number of things that also, you know, uh, took place. For instance, the president was sick. A president was sick. He had to go for medication outside the country. And there was no uh, letter to the National Assembly. It became a problem. What was going to happen? You know, in the case of emergency, and of course, the issue of um, uh, I've forgotten what what is the terminology now. You know, that was used uh, something uh, 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 doctrine, doctrine of doctrine of, of necessity. necessity. That's right, doctrine of necessity. You know, was used to actually provide basis for a success. I mean, at least an acting president to emerge. So, and that immediately. You know, required that the constitution should actually be looked into to see, you know, how you know this kind of unexpected, you know, the development will have to be taken care of in case of what will happen. And then let us also remember that when um, Governor Audu, you know, uh, was elected, he had not been sworn in, and I mean, I mean, there was a, I mean, sorry, the um, the election was considered, you know, uh, inconclusive. And while we are waiting for the uh, rescheduled re re election to take place, he, the guy, I mean, the uh, gentleman died. And that also led to a situation whereby it had to be looked into. What will you do if a situation of that nature will arise in the future? Because it was not also, you know, brought into being, I mean, thought about in, initially. So I would think that, yes, constitutions, well, I mean, indeed, people have said that, you know, Nigerian, Nigeria is, uh, has a soffit of constitutional documents you know we have to have this uh you when we are talking i mean asking the question you refer back to even what happened before independence you know it's uh, I, I think constitutional um, constitution making is a dynamic process because the society itself is <coughs> very dynamic you could say that you know america had had a constitution which had been i think they have uh, amended it for about maximum of 15 or times or so you know, since uh, for over 200 years. Uh, but it, this one, we, I mean, let's, let us assume, for instance, for purposes of this discussion, that there is uh, no truncation of a uh, democratic uh, process in this country. We should actually be having 
a review of what you know constitution we are going to make use of in terms of governance of this country. But of course, you know, arguments are, are, are very varied. Some people said it is. Um, I mean, the constitution claims that it is we, the people of Nigeria, that have actually you know uh, brought this 1999 constitution into being as amended. But people, there are people who are saying no. It was just a committee of 20 that the uh, uh, Salam Abubakar's uh, regime you know, put in place to tinker with the 79 constitution and come up with a document which you now refer to as the 1999 constitution. So people are now saying that that constitution is illegal. But, well, I argue the case that if you can't call that constitution document illegal or not actually produced by Nigerians, even if there was no constitutional assembly to adopt it, but as long as we have actually been using it since 1999 to constitute governance in this country, then it is actually an academic uh, an issue to say that the constitution is illegal. So I think there is a, 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 a need, a crying need for a review because the constitution itself is never, you know, um, uh, is, I mean, the constitution itself is, 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 is never, you know, um, has never taken you know, into consideration the you know, various issues, it's not perfect, that's just to put it very simply. The constitution is not perfect, so we should expect what we are witnessing to take place. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nuhu Yakub. Let's bring in now uh, Honorable Mohammed Tahe Mogunu, who is the Chief Whip of the House of Reps. I have two questions for you, but they are related. One, why seek to amend the constitution? Two, process. The Senate has set up its own 56-member committee. What is the response of the House of Reps to this? Because you need a concurrence of both houses, of both chambers, uh, for you to have a valid law, you know, passed eventually. Is the House going to set up its own committee, or is the House just simply going to rubber stamp what the upper chamber does? Well, uh, thank you very much. Well, to the first part of your question, to borrow the word of uh, an eminent Nigerian jurist of blessed memory, Justice Udo Odoma, who said in one of his judgment that the Constitution is an organic document that is supposed to change with changing times, taking into account both the objective and subjective realities on ground. So the need for constitutional amendment, as rightly posited by the professor, is the need to take into consideration imagined realities of society that is not within the contemplation of the draftsmen or the lawmakers as at the time the constitution was drafted, the constitution being an organic document. For example, the issues of devolution of powers that has now gained currency in our politics today. Whether there should be an amendment of the constitution to take out certain issues from the exclusive legislative list to the concurrent legislative list. For example, issues concerning police, issues concerning prisons, management of prisons, and it is the agitate, uh, agitate, 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 the cry for community policing, state police brought about the need to amend the constitution to bring out police from the exclusive legislative leads to the concurrent legislative leads. Issues concerning holidays. For example, we have states that declare public holidays during uh, Islamic New Year, while as some states do not uh, declare such. So such issues need to be in the concurrent legislative list rather than in the exclusive legislative list. For example, there is the need to even amend issues concerning the uh, judiciary, whether states should have their own national uh, state judicial council that will govern issues concerning state judiciary, create state courts, and even affiliate courts with regards, with regards to issues to which uh, state, uh, the states can, can, can make laws. Issues of uh, independent 
candidacy because of the problem of uh, our political system, our primaries, where it seems like uh, the money bags have taken over the political parties and then to give room for independent candidates to, uh, to also contest election where there is no peer play or level playing field in our political parties. And then even issues of uh, derivation, whether derivation should be extended to uh, hydro power and mineral resources, issues of uh, uh, revenue allocation, whether more the revenue allocation should be altered and then more should be given to the, to the, to the state as opposed to the present situation where the federal is having more considering the enormity of the responsibilities of state governments, whether there is need for creation of more states because there is clamor in the southeast that compared to the other regions they have lesser number of states, then most, uh, um, uh, one more state should be created in the, in the southeast or there should be no need for creation of more states across the nooks and crannies of the country because of the fact that once states are created, a lot of the resources will go to overheads rather than to uh, issues that concern developments that will bring developments to the doorsteps of the people. So these are issues that are not within the contemplation of the drafters of the constitution or the lawmakers as at the time the constitution is making that have now reared their heads and then there is need for a constitutional amendment to take into consideration uh, this uh, process. And then as the professor rightly said, the 1979 constitution and the 1999 constitution is a product of military junta that cannot be considered to be a replica of the wishes and aspirations of the people. And therefore, it is, there, is, there is a lot of lacuna in the constitution because of the fact that it is not a product <coughs> of the popular will of the Nigerian people. Then coming to your second question, tomorrow the House of Representatives is having a, a meeting whereby all the states will be directed to nominate who is going to represent them in the Constitution Amendment uh, Committee so that the committee will be constituted by the Honorable Speaker to kickstart the process of a uh, constitutional amendment. It's not like uh, we, are, we are not uh, also doing something or waiting to concur with what the Senate is going to bring because we are, an, we are operating a bicameral legislature. We are distinct and independent uh, from the Senate. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, uh, Honorable Mohammed uh, Mungulo. You raised a very, uh, you know, germane uh, point uh, issues here. Um, uh, Kinsler and I may be more interested in uh, independent uh, candidacy because we kind of fall to <laughs> <laughs> members of political parties. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, uh, uh, right. Sabia, but, but, but we still end up at the Supreme Court. Of, of course. Know, if there are disputes. Of course. Of <laughs> course. Um, well, let's go back to Lagos. Uh, we have uh, Sabia Bubaka. Uh, who is uh, uh, Sabi Abdullahi? Sabi Abdullahi is the deputy uh, chief whip of the Senate. Uh, 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 Senator Sabi Abdullahi, 56 man committee has been uh, constituted by the Senate, you know, for the purpose of uh, uh, constitution amendment. And you've just listened to uh, your colleague, Honorable Mohammed Mongino, on certain issues. Uh, that will likely be tabled issues that were not contemplated when the military joint as he said you know uh husbanded the constitution that we have been amending all these years now i want to hear from you uh in terms of uh, other issues of uh, or um, ambiguities uh that uh, require amendment uh which will of course uh, sharpen uh, the latest alteration that you are about to engage in Well, thank you very much. I think uh, let me say very clearly that uh, the Chief Whip of the House has actually amply captured the bulk of the issues. Uh, you recall that in the 8th uh, Assembly, we actually went through this exercise. And uh, the intent here is that issues that were not actually you know, approved the last time, uh, perhaps new dynamics have emerged, new facts have emerged, People who were opposed to certain things must have seen differently now how things should be. 
And so we cannot deny Nigerians the opportunity for this exercise because if we do that, it means we are becoming static. And I think I agree totally with uh, both the submission from the two guests there, both the professor and then my colleague, that of course uh, the constitution is an organic document. And so life itself is dynamic. And what perhaps some people saw the last time these issues were brought, and many other people did not see, based on the dynamics of life and all the realities that you know, kept cropping up in Nigeria, it's most likely today that uh, people have seen differently now, and they will be more amenable to agreeing on certain things. And I think the overall intentment is that the Constitution should not be seen as an impediment to our development. And uh, earlier, my colleague in the studio here talked about the issue of education. Today, everybody will tell you that education is the bedrock of national development. If you want to emancipate your people, give them education. If you want to see growth in your economy, educate your people, and so on and so forth. But then, if you look at the constitutional provision that allows people to, to seek this education, we constrain it by saying we are applicable. And I, I believe it should be a duty, a mandatory, in fact, it should be a right for every citizen to be literate, not to be an illiterate. Because today, if you look at the challenges of insecurity that we are facing, most of the victims are illiterate. But they are deploying modern tools that are products of education. So that tells you everybody wants it, but perhaps we have denied many people because we have not put in place processes and measures through either both the constitutional provision and other laws to make it mandatory for people to be educated, at least up to a particular level. So I think this opportunity is definitely a very good one. And I know, as a matter of fact, now that the committee has been put in place, the process has started. And many of our colleagues may have different issues. That's why we are representative of the people. So as they introduce various issues for amendment, all of it will now be aggregated and referred to the Constitutional Amendment Committee. And I think that is where the process will start. So, and at the end of the day also, I will expect that, as it is uh, customary in our process, both the Senate and the House will definitely come to meet so that we are able to do concurrence to shorten or prevent all the time that may perhaps be wasted. And our intention here is to make this thing possible as quick as we can so that politics does not creep in. We all know by next year, you know, by the end of next year, definitely, if we are not able to do anything, uh, politics will have started creeping in. And I think uh, we cannot afford to do that because the issues that are needed our attention are very, very, very serious because they border on our existence as a people, whether you look at it from the perspective of the insecurity that we are dealing with, which we will say is driven by poverty, is driven by unemployment, and so many other ills in the society. Uh, I believe the primary ro role of the legislature is to promote good governance. That is what we swore to. And I think if by amending the Constitution to enhance good governance, we will definitely be doing our job. And lastly, uh, the other aspect that I think is very critical, and I'm going to say this with all sincerity and, you know, element of patriotism uh, fully, because the issue of local government, Nigerians have been playing lip service to it. There is an elitist gang up. The resources meant for local government is being eaten not in the local government, not for the purpose of the people. And today, all the ungovernable spaces we are dealing with are at the local government level. The villages we talk about belongs to one local government. The towns belong to one local government. And it is the aggregate of local government in each state that forms the state. So I think Nigerians must rise up this time around and make sure that we bring back governance to that particular level. The idea where we bring in this joint account, and many people are using it to do whatever they like, I think the time for it is now, otherwise our existence is fully threatened. You deny those people at that level, and today they are collecting it through another you know, method. The idea of ransom today, the kidnapping for ransom, is, is, is clearly a, a challenge. Most of the youths are unemployed, they have nothing doing, they are conscripted. Sometimes they even kidnap them and force them into the kidnapping ring. So I think this is issue that must be dealt with. And uh, I believe last assembly we amended it, but the states did not return the required number. So Nigerians must rise up and face this reality. The resources where you do devolution of power to the states, 
they should be able to generate more resources and to help the local government because the local government is what makes up the state. I think these are issues that are very critical and I look forward to actually seeing that Nigerians give us maximum support. It's not enough for you to say the National Assembly, the state assembly must not be left alone. And in, in talking about the state assembly, the governors must be put under pressure to do the needful because when this crisis come aboard, like in your previous uh, you know, earlier segment, one person, one of your discussants was talking about when the bomb starts, it does not choose. So it's not the question of whether you say you belong to a state, you are in the state capital, or you are in the local government. We are all Nigerian citizens, and we deserve the good life, and everybody must be guaranteed his life so that we can all fulfill our dreams. All right, uh, Senator Shabir Abdullahi, thank you very much there for your comments. Uh, I mean, just to uh, indicate for the benefit of our viewers that uh, the, the Senate committee already has, as it were, uh, two documents from which it is working. One is the 2014 uh, outcome of the National Conference, and then the other is the RFI committee set up by the uh, ruling APC on, on, on restructuring. So perhaps all of these issues will be taken care of. And the situation that you run into in the Eighth Assembly, uh, by which uh, the uh, states, uh, Houses of Assembly, uh, couldn't muster the required number uh, to uh, ratify the, the amendment. So we hope this time that if it's actually a political agenda uh, that you can overcome uh, those issues, depending, of course, on the provisions that you have there. And one other point, I just want to draw, this, draw your attention to this because uh, you were the spokesperson for the 8th uh, Senate. Uh, the 8th Senate focused on trying to review a number of our business laws. It made quite some uh, progress in that regard, especially when the economy was in a recession. But we keep talking about the issue of railway, and railway remains on the exclusive list. Are you going to have to shift that to the concurrent list? If you recall, in the last assembly, we actually worked on it, and we even came up with a bill. That bill was actually to do for the railway sector what was done for the telecom sector. Unfortunately, I think that bill was not signed, but otherwise, I think in the contemplation of the National Assembly, we've actually dealt with that issue to the extent that we believe even local governments, where you have a lucrative particular path, a road, a corridor, you should get people who will be able to provide this rail so that people can actually move their goods and services. So I think it's a very important issue, and uh, the, uh, one of the intentment of the you know, constitutional amendment is to strengthen economic diversification. And I believe anything that will drive our economy definitely deserves our attention, and definitely the, the, the railway you know, you know, issue you, you raised should be one of the primary things we must be able to get through. Okay. Uh, okay, I just wonder, yeah. I wanted to get uh, so, Wangu, uh, Wangu, yes. uh, Wangu, you have listened to uh, members of National Assembly uh, who have uh, spoken so well concerning the uh, amendment uh, that uh, they are about to uh, embark on. What's your take in, you know, in some of the issues they raised, especially uh, from uh, Honorable Monguno when he itemized uh, some of the areas uh, that uh, need to be addressed. And again, um, uh, your fellow uh, guest there in Lagos, uh, that is Senator Abla, he also uh, mentioned some critical areas uh, concerning um, governance, especially the issue of uh, local government. What is your take? Premising the conversation that um, first, be, you, would we ask first whether it was necessary to do that, and there's a consensus that we should do that. But there are certain impediments that we should take out uh, so that we don't hit the, 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 the kind of obstacles that we hit previously. So, uh, uh, Senator Sabi raised the issue about the role of the governors and their, their, the way that uh, their activities, their action impacts on whether you are going to get a law across or not. Take, for instance, what you have in the states now. Uh, there, in, in most states, you have a, you, the, the governor is returning from a tree from Abuja, and there's a circular that says that the, the speaker and members of the House of Assembly should come and wait for the governor uh, at the airport. What does that tell you? What, what that tells you is that in most of the states, you cannot guarantee that the state houses of assembly uh, will take independent action. So 
this is not legislatable. There is no way we can't legislate that. We then will necessarily will have to put the pressure on the governors and bring them in the loop in the conversation around constitutional amendment in a way that they also understand that you do not make law for today, that law, law that you make must be necessarily that which will drive development both for the state and, and the generality of uh, the people who live in this country. So uh, that's, that's number one. Subnational governance, the attention to subnational governance is very, very key in constitutional amendment because that is where the, the roadblock, because the issues to be, uh, uh, to, to be, to, to be amended, they are, they are varied and they are many. When that debate starts, and, and you can, like uh, uh, Kinsley said, you have already harvested from uh, the, 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 the 2014 uh, um, um, con conference, you also have the 2016 amendment, so you, you can move on from there. The issues of independent candidacy is something that didn't fly, so why didn't it fly? We need to interrogate why, the, why that issue didn't fly. We need to is look at this issue of democratizing the railway. We want to look at whether the, the, the colonialists, you know, made railway for every community. What was the, what was the, the driving for, you know, for, for situating these things. We just construct roads. There are big roads that lead to nowhere in Nigeria that does not serve any economic purpose. Are we going to begin this process of ensuring that every village in Nigeria has a railway? Is railway for transportation? Is railway for goods and services? The, the reason you need to do all of this thinking is what we'll get into when the debate starts. But as for the property, we need to be clear that we can't do constitutional amendment in 2016 and then maybe after this when politics takes over like uh, uh, senator sabi says we will not be able to conclude those issues when the next senate when the next uh, national assembly comes it goes back again to constitutional amendment we must take definite holistic futuristic look into the process of lawmaking in a way that addresses at least the fundamental challenges that we face so that we don't turn this thing to a ritual I have a feeling that every National Assembly that comes wants to get into constitutional amendment. And at the end of the day, you do that, how much pressure, how much, how much can you expedite action in a way that by 2021, 2022, you are done with the issue of constitutional amendment, you are done with the issue of uh, assent and all the back and forth that goes with it in a way that politics eventually does not take over those, these issues. Otherwise, we'll just be going around constitutional amendment for the purpose of constitutional amendment. And I don't think that that is what it should be. I agree with Professor Du. I agree with the, 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 the Honorable that, yes, it is important, but we must take determined effort to ensure that we don't turn this into, into an industry or a ritual. Okay. Uh, as I want to go, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, come to Professor Nu Yakubo, uh, leaning on the point that you made earlier, uh, where we have seen, for instance, the role of the State Independent Electoral Commissions. Uh, and, and the general opinion is that uh, uh, those commissions are not delivering on credible elections at the local government level. Uh, and the suggestion is, okay, what, what, what should happen? How do we strengthen them? Uh, part of what has been on the, on the cards has often been, no, let the Independent National Electoral Commission also conduct local government elections. But how do you reconcile that with, with. the clamor for true federalism? Well, and devolution of powers, yeah. which are also items that you find on the plate yeah, when you're talking about amendment to the Constitution. Well, the, 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 the issue about um, true federalism, I, I always have a problem conceptually with what is called true federalism. I would rather, you know, because there's no, there are no two federal systems that are alike. So which one is the true one? So first, conceptually, I normally try to define it as functional federalism. So, well, we take it from that point. And based on what is the experience so far, I, I think that if you are really talking about democratization, democratic consolidation, I think that, you know, it, is in the wisdom, it should be in the wisdom of the current effort to amend the constitution to see that state independent electoral commissions are removed from the constitution. Let, the, let that be one single national, I mean, I, I, INEC, if you have one single INEC that you know is is able to also you know um, you know um, I mean, is so also able to you know improve on its own efficiency, based on I mean, on the experiences we have had recently, 
I think that you know that is part of the um, uh, uh, um, I mean part of the processes they should be able to handle, and mm -hmm. it is so handled in a manner that you know the national I mean the INEC and the, I mean the national one is not under the you know um, control or direction of any particular mm -hmm. state. This will actually guarantee, as I said earlier, if we are determined to actually have democratic consolidation in this country, we really need to look at it. And I'm also thinking that, you know, other issues that are, have, you know, have been mentioned during this discussion, and what is also in the I mean, public domain in terms of discussion, for instance, the issue of a state police, you know, it's something that also has to be considered, you know, and made, you know, a part of what is going to be take place okay. in the current review exercise. No, all right, thank you. Uh, we ran out of time, but I'd like to bring in uh, um, uh, Honorable Mohamed Mogunobe in just a few seconds. Now, you're going to be harvesting from the 2014 conference, as well as the AROFI uh, uh, committee recommendation. Would that be uh, uh, useful uh, to you? Yes, it's going to be a, a very useful guide because there are product of some sort of a consensus building amongst Nigerians as to be the guiding principle or the compass that the National Assembly will use in the process of a, a constitutional <coughs> amendment. And besides that, one important issue that I forgot to mention that should also get the attention of the National Assembly in this process of constitutional amendment is the issue of suppression of the Office of Attorney General and that of a uh, Minister of Justice or Attorney General of the State and the Commissioner of, of, of Justice. As a former Attorney General in my state, I know the enormity of the powers the Office of the Attorney General has with regard to nolly prosecute discontinuance of a uh, uh, criminal proceeding at any stage before final judgment is given. Such office is very sensitive to be allowed to be determined in a a, a, a political lab, uh, process. It is good to always insulate it from the influence of uh, politicization so that it would operate uh, ind independently. All right, Honorable, <coughs> excuse me, Mongono, um, that's the uh, Chief Whip of the House of Reps. Uh, thank you very much. That I was, uh, the reason I was talking, I was going to. Uh, draw the point that you know where would you recruit the attorney general from uh will it be from the civil service or will it be a private practitioner and so on and so forth if it's in civil service from whom will it take instructions or otherwise but that's a matter that can be considered at some other point uh, honorable uh, mohammed Moguno, once again we appreciate your being with us on the program this morning Professor Nuhu Yaku, former Vice Chancellor of the University of Abuja, thanks a lot for being around as well. It's a pleasure, thanks. In Lagos, we're joined by uh, SN1 Wagu, where civil society activists and chairman partners for electoral reform, plus uh, Senator Sabri Abdullahi, Deputy Chief Whip of the Senate. Gentlemen, thanks a lot for being with us on the program this morning. Okay, so that's it for us on Good Morning Nigeria today. We thank you for being with us. We're, we return tomorrow, same time, 7 in the morning. Until then, have a lovely day. I'm Kingsley Osada Law. And I'm Kieran Umar. It's been wonderful hosting you this morning. Return again tomorrow. We'll be back.